So this is about uh, something called Toolbox. And uh, if you have heard about something called Silverblue, then, the, then I'm going to show you how you're meant to write programs on Silverblue, uh, which kind of sounds odd because uh, Silverblue is supposed to be a Linux distribution. So it shouldn't be too hard to at least write a program on Linux, right, if, uh, if not anything else. But, um, but we'll get into it. Um, um, I'm Rishi on most IRC channels, on, on email, on Fedora. I work in the Red Hat desktop team. These days I w I'm working on Silverblue. I'll tell you more, more about Silverblue if you don't know, if you haven't heard about it. Um, Silverblue is, and I have been working on the Fedora workstation, which is kind of related to Silverblue on various aspects of the workstation. And as a side effect of that, I also work upstream on GNOME like many of my teammates. Um, so I'm going to give a kind of, uh, I'm, quite, I'm going to try to stay a little bit high level, but uh, please do ask if you are interested in some specific point. Um, so uh, Silverblue. So, uh, there's a website called silverblue.federalproject.org. Silverblue uh, but like most uh, free software websites, they don't really tell you exactly what Silverblue is. Uh, it's uh, essentially, in short, the, the next iteration of the Fedora workstation, or maybe the next generation, because iteration doesn't sound as disruptive as it actually kind of is. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so the idea is that it, it promises robust upgrades, so you don't need to worry about like your DNF update failing and then your computer is no longer booting because, I don't know, you lost power or something went very wrong or something like that. And it's easy to roll back. So in that sense, it's kind of like your operating system is now part of a Git repository, though it's exactly not that, but kind of gives you that feeling that you can like reverting back and forth is uh, trivial now. It, you don't need to painstakingly figure out which, which package was updated or which wasn't completely updated and do all that. It's, uh, it's just, uh, it's trivial enough that a very non-technical person should be able to do it. If not by himself or herself, you should be able to call that person up and it's just a button press away. Um, and the, another big idea is that the operating system is uh, separated from the applications. So, uh, like, historically, all the LibreOffice packages and the Firefox packages and the GCC packages and the Grub and the Gnome Shell and the Mutter and the Dbus packages and the Kernel package, they're all part of one thing, right? I mean, you can't really update your LibreOffice package without updating also your glibc and everything. So you basically move from one version of Fedora to another and you get the whole thing as one thing. And they, like, the LibreOffice that you're running is linking against the same uh, glibc that, uh, that, uh, that something else is using, like say Gnome Shell is using or so on and so forth. So it's just one, it used to be one thing. Uh, it's kind of no longer like that. So, so, the, so, so when you install Silverblue, you have the operating system and the, and the, and the applications sort of decoupled. Uh, and I'm using the word application in a little like, I'm like fuzzing around a bit, like uh, I'm not exactly defining what it is, but if you're talking about applications in terms of uh, graphical applications, then, uh, then these applications are a little bit more secure than they used to be on uh, the legacy Fedora workstation. And, and the operating system itself is, a, is an OS3 image, kind of similar to CoreOS, I believe. And the applications uh, and the graphical applications are distributed as flat packs. Uh, could be Fedora flat packs, or could be from somewhere else. Could be from FlatUp. Uh, and uh, just so you're sure that Silverblue as a real thing, I'm actually running Silverblue right now uh, to give this presentation. So it kind of works. <laughs> I mean, it it already works very well if you are like a non-technical user, like because uh, the graphical things and all these things work. But uh, things get problematic if you are like a uh, like a developer. If you are actually working on the OS itself, or if you are actually writing programs to build things on top of the OS, then then this whole lockdown aspect of the whole thing starts to get into your way, and it can become annoying and things like that. But but the basic idea already works, and if you need to give it to somebody who's like 
a casual user, user it's, uh, it works. It, it's, it's a lot harder to break and so on. And so if you want to know more, there's a talk tomorrow at 2 o'clock uh, in Panorama. It's called On the Way to the Future of Federal Workstation. It's given by my teammates, Tomas and Iji. So I, I don't want to t talk too much about Silver Blue. It's better go to their talk. Uh, so those were the good parts of Silver Blue. Uh, so, so now it's uh, time to face the problems. So the one thing you realize when you, once you like, uh, once you open up a terminal on Silver Blue is that there is no DNF. There's no like the traditional Linux package manager thing not there. Uh, you'll also slowly realize that slash USR is mounted on a read-only file system. So just having root access also doesn't really help because it's read-only. The mount is read-only. And uh, that's where you figure out that uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, actually start hacking on this machine. Right? I mean, how do you install your compilers uh, like, or your, I mean, how do you install uh, Node.js or uh, Ruby or GCC or strace or whatever it is that you want or Emacs or Veeam or whatever it is that you need. Um, so, I mean, this screenshot was just supposed to be a placeholder for a demo, but I'll try to like actually show you what the problem is. So, so I'll start a terminal. Try to increase the font size a little bit. So yeah, so so there is no DNF here, right? And uh, there's definitely no GCC and no Emacs, or it's kind of now. What do I do? And uh, there is RPM though. Although you'd also realize that RPM is kind of in a read-only mode, so you can query the database, but you can't really install new packages. Which is sort of a lie, but but let's put it that way. And you also soon come across this strange thing called RPM OS3. Uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, I'll try to just scroll. Uh, yeah, so there is this thing called RPM OS3, and it shows you some things about your machine, but it doesn't really help you to solve your uh, GCC or Emacs problem, but what it says is that you have you're booted into this version of uh, Silver Blue, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and things like that. So, so I just showed you this thing to show you that this is actually something strange that's running on this machine. Um, but, but it's Fedora, though. I mean, if you go to Fedora release, you see that it's Fedora 30. So, it's Fedora, but not really the usual thing. Yeah. So, so one thing. So there are some hacks and niche solutions already out there that that work to various degrees of. Uh, I mean, the degrees of success depends on what you really want and how hacky or how niche your needs are, or so on. So the so one hacky solution is to use something called package layering. So this RPM OS3 tool that uh, that I was playing with, it actually lets you install RPM packages, like random R RPM packages, so you could do RPM OS3 install GCC. But the problem is that you would have to reboot to get GCC. Which kind of, so the, need, the reason that you need to reboot is kind of actually sound by design. Uh, it's kind of the thing that makes Silverblue so robust. But in this case, it can get annoying. Like you are in the middle of a debugging run, or you're just trying to like build something, and then you need to reboot every time for every dependency of your project. It's just not the right fit all the time. Uh, I mean, usually for an, for a non-technical end user, the dependency problem is already solved, and you just hit one command, and everything comes in. But as a developer who is just playing around, it's uh, it it becomes a problem. And if you do too much of this RPM OS3 package layering thing, you also start to like, uh, you also start to damage the benefits of Silverblue because the more RPMs that you layer on, the more, uh, the more flaky your system starts to, be, starts to become because, because of various reasons. I mean, if you're not convinced, I can get into that, but it's better you go to the silver blue talk or ask questions there so that we don't get too sidetracked. So that's the hacky solution. So you can just uh, do package layering and reboot. 
And then there's the uh, one niche solution that I am aware of that if you're like just interested in building like graphical applications, targeting GNOME and Flatpaks, then you have this ID called GNOME Builder that basically knows how to, how to survive in this kind of an environment. So it's kind of, but it's kind of really, if you want to do a, write a graphical application that you want to distribute it as, as a flat pack. It won't work if you just want your development prefix where you just install and build random projects that you want to like, I don't know, like maybe you are, maybe you are a GCC developer and you want to build GCC for example, then definitely GNOME Builder won't work. So, so, so we have this thing called Toolbox, that's where the Toolbox comes in. It even has a logo these days, so it's kind of a real project, apparently. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need a logo these days. So there's the GitHub page. So in short, uh, what this thing does is it uh, gives you back your uh, familiar RPM-based uh, environment. You have your DNF and you can do all the things that you're used to doing so far. And this environment that you get is uh, somehow decoupled from your host operating system. So even if you completely damage the development environment, you still can boot your machine. And uh, I think it should just keep working, I would say. And it used to be known as Fedora Toolbox. We dropped that prefix because, uh, yeah. I mean, it was Fedora Toolbox because it was kind of driven by Fedora. And, and then people thought we can, uh, but whatever. But, I mean, it doesn't matter, but the thing is like if somebody says Fedora Toolbox, you know that it's just Toolbox these days. So uh, back to our like demo. So we have this situation now. So if you did something like this, nothing really happens, but you get a new shell which looks slightly different with that um, purple thing in the front. And now suddenly you have DNF here, and you can do something like this trace. Yeah, and uh, so so that works. And uh, and there is no RPM OS tree here anymore, right? But this is also still Fedora. Right, so this is the deal. Like you type in uh, toolbox enter and then you get a new prompt and then you get your DNF and then it's just how it used to be, right? Hopefully. But now the graphical applications. Yeah, they should also work. We'll get to that, but uh, yeah, but they should also work. Uh, Maybe I have something here to show you, maybe. Well, I don't. Okay, I'll just, just leave it running in the background so that I can show you later. But we'll get to it in a little while. So uh, by now you might have been like able to guess that there is something about containers at play here because like it's decoupled from the host and uh, there is no virtual machine involved so it sort of sounds like containers. And it is. Uh, it uses. Uh, it's based a lot on a lot on all these uh, open containers initiative standards and everything around that. Uh, specifically, it uses something called Podman, uh, and even more specifically, is Podman running without root, so rootless Podman. Um, the reason the reason the rootless part is important is because like uh, not long ago. Um, it, I mean, you couldn't run Podman without root, and so was Docker. Like, I think there is something called rootless Docker now, but I don't know how mature it is. But Docker is usually it needs root access of some kind to run the thing. So, yeah. So th there is no root involved here so you, because uh, it's and th it shouldn't be involving root because we are like we are essentially trying to provide a replacement for a shell running inside a terminal emulator. So it would be really weird to have uh, your bash running as pseudo bash or something. Well, it does raise the question of like when you did the DNF install, right, you do pseudo in front of it. Is that, is that just muscle memory or is that because you're still 
looking for root access inside the container. Yeah, because I'm looking for root access inside the container. Right. So should should it just be like should you not require the crib? I don't know. I mean, I, it probably won't work. I mean, I. I I mean, I honestly haven't tried. I mean, it's kind of muscle memory too. But but the sudo inside the container is not real sudo on your host. It's a map to some other user, and it's kind of limited to that container. You can't really use the sudo inside the container to, I don't know, do something that really needs a UID zero on the host. And uh, yeah, so it uses Podman and containers and all these things. And uh, yeah, so 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 the so why the toolbox? So, so, the, so containers are kind of like what, like namespaces and some file system magic and stuff like that. And uh, things like Docker and Podman already make it a lot easier to work with containers, so why toolbox? The idea is that like, uh, like the average developer using Silverblue might not even know, know container technology very well, and even if they do know containers very well, because they maybe work with containers all the time, they probably don't know how their desktop works very well, because we want this kind of seamless, um, seamless integration between the, between the development environment and what you're running on your laptop. Because what we are really trying to do is like replace the shell for development. And if things don't work very smoothly, then it will again be just annoying. And uh, and we don't want to burden people with like asking them to run Podman with like uh, 30 different command line flags like Podman run dash 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 this. Dash, dash. It's, it just doesn't work. It's, you need something that will just pop up in your uh, terminal emulator and sort of just work. So that's, that's the whole point of having this project. Yeah, like you, so that you don't need to figure, I mean, like he was asking, like you don't need to worry about whether your graphical apps will work or whether your SSH agent will work or whether this or that or this little thing will work or not work. So uh, the Silverblue toolbox was inspired by this thing that CoreOS had back in the day. Well, not back in the day as in like a year ago. We are talking <laughs> about a year back. Uh, sounds like a long time, but not really. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, and they used, uh, and it used to use something called RKT or Rocket, that was a CoreOS project, and the system DN spawn. But it also needed sudo back then, which was a problem. But uh, this thing served as our inspiration to what we actually needed, because, because I remember we spent a lot of time discussing what we really need to solve this problem, and nobody really had a clear idea, and there was a lot of strange jargon flying around, like container technology, this and that, and, uh, and then we came across this thing on GitHub and we were like, yeah, this seems like the kind of user experience or developer experience that you want. And, and, then, and then we built from there, like of course the internals are, not, are entirely different and uh, yeah, but, but the basic idea that you type something and you get a prompt and then you work there. So it's, I think it's still a relatively new project. I mean, given the fact that we didn't really know what we were doing when we started, we just wanted to sort of see what will happen if we do something like this. And it literally started like, I think, a few months after Rootless Podman was even a thing. So in it kind of, they got developed in lockstep and uh, things would break and, things, and basically like very, two very young projects like driving each other forward. And and for better or for worse, this this prototype got really quickly adopted by Silverblue users. And I kind of thought that there weren't that many Silverblue users, but apparently there were. And uh, and they are all kind of like f early adopters, so they are all like programmers or contributors of some kind, like t technical users, I would say. And uh, I guess you hit this hurdle very very soon if you are some someone with that mindset that you can't really how do you unlock this thing to to do your own thing. And yeah, like uh, I was kind of a little shocked that th this uh, little shell script that we were playing with suddenly had real users and people were filing bugs and whatnot and they were expecting, uh, like, I don't know what. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like it's, it's still like just a shell script because uh, I don't think we ever, I think we are like n not much of a prototype anymore these days, like, but yeah, I mean, so that flavor is still there. That 
so yeah, like I don't know if that other thing fit. Oh, sorry. So I'll quickly wrap up. So what works? Um, yeah. So will and the next applications work? So if you have Emacs inside your toolbox, it should work. Uh, SSH agents, like if you don't need to keep typing in your SSH password. Uh, if you have Dbus clients and daemons running, like you usually do on your desktop, they they should keep working as you shouldn't feel the difference. Uh, Kerberos should work, assuming that you're using the KCM credentials cache, which I think uh, most of you are because Fedora switched to it for a while ago. So knit k, -knit k -list, those things should keep working. Uh, if you plug in your USB, your camera, those things should work. Those things should, I mean, the contents of your USB should be visible inside the toolbox. Uh, things that don't work, uh, usually like, uh, we've, I mean, usually uh, people filing bugs is how we figure out how, what doesn't work. Like long ago, like somebody filed a bug that they couldn't compile LLVM or something because SS SHM underscore open, that system call, wasn't working or something was running with some weird permission and or whatever. So people file bugs and we figure out what's not working. Uh, so these are some random things that we know don't work. If you need services running on the system dbus instance, they don't really work. Uh, various uh, nmap options, they need root, real root on the host, they don't work. Uh, we have seen some glitches in tmax, for example, some really strange things, and I, I am not sure, like, uh, we tracked it down a little bit, but not yet. I mean, it's not clear what's going on. Uh, the NVIDIA driver, always a problem. It's like a... <laughs> Uh, it can it can be a stock answer to everything like what doesn't work Nvidia, but uh, but we we also have a rough solution for it. Uh, audio probably doesn't work because uh, I mean just didn't look into it. Like should probably look it. Yeah, it yeah, should be easy. It's just something that we, yeah we we have seen some strange errors from this uh, locale command once in a while. Uh, yeah, something to figure out. I don't know. We have the people for that. Here. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, so the, what, what else to do? What's left to do? Like we need to write tests. Uh, I mean, it, we basically don't have any tests. And uh, we are working with the Podman team to uh, somehow like sing, uh, like keep our tests aligned. Uh, we need to write it in something that's not POSIX shell, possibly Go, I think, because the whole in, uh, ecosystem is written in Go. Um, and yeah, we, and we would like to have some uh, wrappers for well-known commands to make things a little less uh, rough because, uh, the pro the, because the problem starts is that if you have uh, plenty of these shells on your computer lying around with toolbox and whatnot, then the other problem that you have is that you don't know which is your toolbox shell and which is your host shell and what is what. And then you're like, oh, why, why is my RPM OS3 not working here or whatever. And, and oh, I can't type. And all these uh, like annoyances build up. So, so the idea is that uh, we could have some wrappers inside the toolbox environment, which basically, which basically sort of magically get you what you want. I have lots of for this yeah. So, so, so that's it. That's all I had to say. <laughs>